in April 1969, 12 years after Laura Ingalls Wilder's death. Ursula Nordstrom, her former editor at Harper and Brothers and a prominent children's book librarian wrote, the young man, Roger Lee McBride, who inherited all the assets of Laura Ingalls Wilder's daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, came in a few days ago and dropped the casual remark that there is a ninth Wilder manuscript written after these happy golden years. I asked why in Mercy's name we had never been given it, and he explained that it covers the first year of married life for Laura and Romanzo, and that there is a faint air of disillusion in it, which Laura's daughter thought not suited for the feeling of the eight published books. Why didn't Wilder send the manuscript to Ursula Nordstrom at Harper's during her lifetime? Did Wilder share the manuscript with Lane? What did Lane really think of the manuscript? And how can that faint air of disillusion be explained? I'll try to briefly answer these questions in this lecture, but very little survives other than the manuscript itself that sheds light on any of these questions. First, let's get some basic chronology out of the way. These Happy Golden Years was published in 1943. Wilder lived another 14 years. She died in 1957. Lane died in 1968. Clearly, both women felt that these happy golden years served as the best ending for the Little House series. In other words, the series author and its principal editor both felt creatively satisfied with how the series ended back in 1943. As we've just seen, these happy golden years ends with a sense of hope and optimism. Laura is about to embark on her life as a married woman. Her childhood is past, yet the future with Almanzo in a new little house beckons. It is a perfect ending. But Wilder obviously wrote this ninth manuscript. Why? What prompted her to write it? In the late 1930s, Wilder was writing By the Shores of Silver Lake and she and Lane exchanged ideas about the last books in the series and how the series would end. Wilder was already thinking about the closing lines for the last novel, which had the working title of Prairie Girl. In her original outline for the book, which she shared with Lane, Wilder envisioned this ending. The horses stand quietly beside the claim shanty within the hollow square of young cottonwoods. There is no light in the windows, but the music of Pa's fiddle floats softly out. Laura's voice joins it singing just above her breath. In the starlight, in the starlight, we will wander gay and free, for there's nothing in the daylight half so dear to you and me. And while we wait, Manly whispered, I will build us a little house on the tree claim where the trees will shelter it as they grow. The end. Immediately below these words, Wilder added, or words to this effect. The scene she outlined here and planned as the ending for the last book is Lars' acceptance of Almanzo's proposal. Home in the starlight, Wilder wrote, Manly has the ring. Yet, Wilder wrote her editor at Harper's toward the end of 1937 with the idea to write a grown-up story about Laura and Almanzo. This would be an adult novel for adult readers. Laura and Almanzo would be a young married couple. From the context of existing correspondence between Wilder and Lane, Wilder also discussed this idea with her daughter at the same time. Lane wasn't optimistic about the idea. She wrote, As you're doing an adult novel, there's no reason why you shouldn't if you want to. But unless by wild chance you did a bestseller, there is much more money in writing juveniles. Lane's response to her mother's idea to write an adult novel might have related more to her own career than her mother's. Lane's adult novel, Free Land, 
would be published in 1938 and was based on Wilder's Pioneer Girl material. Lane might not have welcomed the prospect of competing against a bestseller from her mother because even by 1937, Laura Ingalls Wilder was writing bestsellers. Granted, they were for children, but Wilder's literary reputation was beginning to outstrip her daughters, even in late 1937. And it's interesting to note that after decades of advising her mother not to expect to earn any money in children's books, Lane has now come to the conclusion that there is much more money in writing for juveniles. Wilder felt compelled to explain her reasoning for suggesting an adult novel to Harper and Brothers. I thought it might wangle a little more advertising for the little house books if I said I might write a grown-up one. It was not a promise, and if I didn't, it wouldn't matter. From the context of this letter, it's clear that Wilder hadn't yet written her adult novel. After all, she was working on her first young adult title and arguing with Lane about creative issues in that book. Laura versus Carrie is the main character, Mary's blindness, the adult stuff in By the Shores of Silver Lake. Wilder's creative hands were full. But this letter implies that Wilder and Lane had an established working title for Wilder's grown-up book. It was identified as the first three years. And Wilder wanted to make sure that Lane didn't intend to use this material herself in yet another pioneer novel like Let the Hurricane Roar or The Upcoming Free Land. She asked her daughter if she ever expected to use the framework of the first three years in a book of your own. And perhaps in recognition of Lane's sensitivity to the idea that her mother might be moving in on her genre, Wilder suggested, I could write the rough work. You could polish it and put your name to it if that would be better than mine. The idea of a grown-up novel temporarily disappears from view as Wilder finished By the Shores of Silver Lake and The Long Winter. But in 1940, Wilder wrote her literary agent, George By, that she was considering a book to follow the eighth book in the series. Telling of what next happens is taking shape slowly in my mind, but it is too soon to say if it will crystallize into a completely adult novel. I can only say perhaps it may be so. From the context of this letter, Wilder knew that an adult novel required a different approach than one for young readers, and in 1940, she wasn't sure she was up to the creative challenge. But three years later, that adult novel was still on her mind. As she wrote George By, I have thought that golden years was my last, that I would spend what is left of my life in living, not writing about it. But a story keeps stirring around in my mind, and if it pesters me enough, I may write it down and send it to you sometime in the future. The story obviously pestered her enough because she did write it down, entitling the manuscript The First Three Years and a Year of Grace. And from the context of the surviving correspondence, she probably wrote it in the mid-1940s. But no correspondence survives to indicate if she shared the finished draft with Lane. Given the silence on the subject in correspondence that does survive, it seems likely that Lane didn't know about this manuscript until after her mother's death. So why did Wilder apparently keep this manuscript a secret during the last years of her life? It's impossible to know with any certainty, but she must have felt that on some level, for some reason, the manuscript wouldn't serve her literary legacy well. As I mentioned in my biography of Wilder, it could simply be that she didn't feel the first three years quite crystallized into an adult novel. She may have realized that her creative strength was in writing for young readers, not adults. Or perhaps Wilder decided to live her life rather than write about it. Although her literary legacy blossomed in the 1940s, the decade proved to be personally difficult for Wilder. 
Her sister, Grace Ingalls Dow, died in 1941. Carrie Ingalls Swansea died in 1946. And Almanzo died in 1949. In 1952, Wilder anticipated her own death, writing Elaine a letter that began, Rose, dearest, when you read this, I will be gone, and you will have inherited all I have. If the deaths of Caroline and Mary Ingalls in the 1920s had initially inspired Wilder to write Pioneer Girl and go on to create the Little House series, the deaths of her sisters and her husband may have ushered in the end of Wilder's writing career. Revising and editing a book about personal loss during a decade of personal losses may have proven too much for Wilder. For whatever reason, the original manuscript for what we now know as the first four years languished until Roger Lee McBride brought it to Ursula Nordstrom's attention. Lane had first met Roger Lee McBride through her literary connections. He was the son of Bert McBride, the editor of Reader's Digest. She adopted Roger informally as her grandson in the 1940s. And when George By died in 1957, McBride became Lane's literary agent. He was a lawyer by then and worked with Lane to manage Wilder's literary estate. In 1962, the pair had authorized Harper and Rowe to publish On the Way Home. When Lane died, he became her literary executor and began to offer a series of manuscripts to Wilder's publisher, starting with the first four years. The manuscript was problematical because of that faint air of disillusion in it. It lacked warmth, optimism, and the distinctive voice generations of readers had come to expect from Wilder's Little House series. Even the character of Laura seemed different. The Laura who marries Elmanzo Wilder in these happy golden years embraces life on the prairie, admires Elmanzo's skill as a farmer, and looks forward to their new life together with optimism and an open heart. By contrast, the Laura in the first three years in A Year of Grace was shrewd, calculating, and critical. She seems motivated by financial security, not the joy of frontier life and the virtues of the agrarian tradition. A farmer never has any money, this new and different Laura tells this slightly different Almanzo, manly, in this manuscript. Laura marries manly reluctantly, questioning his love of the land and belief in farming. I don't want to marry a farmer, she tells him. I have always said I never would. I do wish you would do something else. The line sounds more like Nellie Olson than Laura Ingalls. In fact, the central conflict of the manuscript centers on farming. Laura forces Manley to make this promise before she'll accept his proposal of marriage. And he tells her, if you'll try it for three years, and I haven't made a success in farming by that time, I'll quit and do anything you want me to do. Faced with such an unpleasant new Laura, what should Ursula Nordstrom at Harper's do with the manuscript? You ask how much leeway do we have in editing or changing the manuscript, she wrote. Well, I think Rose Wilder Lane's grandson will let us do some judicious editing but I think we better not. I would hate like hell to tamper with this. Reading between the lines, Roger McBride would have advocated a change in voice, making the Laura of the first three years in A Year of Grace more consistent with the Laura readers had last seen in these happy golden years. This was a position he took later authorizing ghost-written spin-off books, most notably about Rose Wilder Lane, in a style that emulated Wilder's own, but without the literary integrity of the original series. And he, of course, authorized the development of the television series, which broadened the exposure of Wilder's books and characters, but simultaneously diluted and changed them. 
Nordstrom, on the other hand, realized that Wilder's work should remain Wilder's work, regardless of that faint air of disillusion. The manuscript's title was changed to the first four years, and it was published in 1971 as a new Little House book. Garth Williams returned as illustrator for the book, perhaps Ursula Nordstrom's one strategic editorial move to soften that faint air of disillusion. In print, the Laura of this book may be different, but the illustrations create that familiar warmth, hope, and spirit readers had come to expect in the established Little House books. Roger Lee McBride also wrote an introduction to the book and addressed the issue of its new voice. My own guess is that Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote this one in the late 1940s and that after Almanzo died, she lost interest in revising and completing it for publication. Because she didn't do so, there's a difference from the earlier books in the way the story is told. While this may be accurate, Wilder certainly didn't revise this manuscript, and it's very likely that she wrote it in the mid to late 1940s. The differences in style and tone have less to do with Wilder's situation when she wrote the first four years and more to do with its audience. The book is Wilder's attempt to write that grown-up novel, to appeal to more mature and experienced readers and their more careworn vision of reality. Laura and Manley in this book are hauntingly similar to Caroline and Charles in this one, Let the Hurricane Roar. A close reading of both books reveals a similarity in style, tone, characterization, and even plot.